All right, this is day two of the Prime Minister's uh, three-day visit to the U.S. And these are live pictures coming in of the cultural program uh, in Long Island, that community event that's uh, happening in New York. Of course, reminiscent of what happened in the, back in 2014 at the Madison Square and, of course, Howdy Modi in uh, 2019 as well. But this time, it seems it's bigger given the fact that there are almost 14,000 uh, Indian Americans and members of the Indian diaspora who are expected to attend that event. Uh, in fact, that's the uh, you know number of seats available inside the stadium. Of course, a lot of uh, uh, you know, huge crowds outside the stadium as well. The Prime Minister is expected to address uh, the members of the Indian diaspora at around 9.15 p.m. Indian time. Uh, the Prime Minister's diaspora outreach has really become a trademark of all his visits abroad. But let me go straight across to my colleague Natasha, who's joining us from inside the stadium where this event is taking place. Natasha, it's over to you. Uh, the Prime Minister expected to uh, address the members of the Indian diaspora at 9.15 Indian time. But what's front and centre is the Indian American community and Indian culture. Hold on, Natasha, we'll try and fix that audio line with you. I'm afraid we have very uh, patchy audio at your end. Uh, we'll try and fix that. But I think the what Natasha was saying, that it's really a lot of cult cultural extravaganza that we see on display there at the Long Island event. Uh, and also the diversity of the Indian American uh, community as well, because we saw uh, scientists, doctors, of course, IT professionals, uh, chefs, so many people there at the community event, as I said, reminiscent of 2014 and 2019. But this diaspora outreach, certainly a very important hallmark of the Prime Minister's diplomacy. Uh, in fact, uh, he recently went to Austria and he addressed uh, members of the Indian community there as well. Uh, so this diaspora outreach, certainly a very important part of uh, the Prime Minister's diplomacy. And look at those absolutely stunning visuals coming in from Long Island. Also represents a diversity of what it's being, uh, what it's uh, you know what it is to be Indian, given the fact that you have garba and so many different forms of Indian dance on uh, display there as well, dance and music and color. Um, certainly a very important part of the Prime Minister's visits, as I said. Um, you you know the Prime Minister time and again has said that the Indian diaspora um, has really been making India proud abroad. In fact, if you just talk about the Indian diaspora in America, it's really grown and how. We have come a long way uh, given the fact that uh, we're also a very critical political force there, um, you know, from uh, positions of, uh, uh, you know, a mayor and other such senior positions. So, of course, you have a person of Indian origin now uh, running for president as well, uh, which is what makes it so special, uh, you know, the Indian American community there as far as America is concerned, as far as the U.S. is concerned. Let me uh, bring in my guests uh, at this point. Professor Zinia Behel is with us, Professor and Political Analyst. Uh, Meera Shankar will also be joining us, former Ambassador of India to the U.S. Also, Jonah Blank, a former advisor to uh, President Biden and a foreign policy expert. Thanks all very much for being with us. Um, uh, you know, Jonah, going across to you first, uh, you know, President Biden and his administration um, have also pointed out how critical a force is the Indian American community. And that's what perhaps we see in these visuals as well. It's a vibrant community and it has grown really in the past four to five years. Yes, that's absolutely true. When President Biden began his political career, uh, Indian Americans were non-players politically. Even well into his career, he frequently cited the Indian American community in Delaware as uh, a community of small business people and entrepreneurs, which is true, but it's exploded far beyond that just in the past few decades. And we can see in President Biden inviting Prime Minister Modi to his home in Wilmington, Delaware, just the level of respect he wants to convey. Absolutely. And let me bring in Amb Ambassador Meera Shankar as well. 
Ambassador Shankar, as we were discussing earlier as well, um, you know, this soft diplomacy, as it were, is also an extremely critical part of the Prime Minister's outreach. All right, I'm being told Mira Shankar is not uh, there with us yet. Uh, Professor Zinia, would you like to weigh in on that? Um, what is the sentiment in the U.S. as far as, you know, this outreach to the Indian diaspora is concerned? I'm sure it's being watched very, very closely there as well. Yes, absolutely. I mean, this isn't the first time that Modi had, has addressed the Indian diaspora in the United States. He's done it before. And every time he has done it, you know, um, um, tickets, uh, seats pretty much have been sold out within minutes. It's really hard to get it. You have to really keep a close eye. Uh, I have tried in the past. And um, it's always a full house, right? And as you can see from the visuals that you're showing, um, there is a lot of excitement. Um, um, you know, it's 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 a jam-packed agenda, um, and people are very excited to hear from him. He's a very charismatic leader, um, um, and you know, whenever he's referenced the Indian diaspora or spoken to them at such events, he's always talked about you know the contributions that. Indians, um, um, people of Indian origin have made, you know, to the United States and to the economy in general, right? Um, especially in the field of STEM and arts when it comes to science, technology, engineering and math, right? Um, um, India has supplied doctors, engineers, scientists, um, just about in every field that contributes significantly to the economy. You see Indians succeeding, leading, right? Leading teams, leading implementations. So, um, it's it's very exciting, right? Uh, something that brings us all together. The diversity that is India that is on display there um, um, in Long Island. Twenty four thousand people um, expected to attend. So um, yeah, it, it it is something that makes me as an Indian and as a member of the Indian diaspora um, very proud, right? Very proud to see such a warm welcome for Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Absolutely. And Mr. Blank, what do you have to say about that? Because I think one interesting <coughs> point that you made, Professor Behel, was that, you know, Indians are also leading key positions uh, in the U.S. I mean, not just in politics, but if you look at the corporate world, I mean, Indians are co-founders uh, in more than 70 uh, U.S. unicorns. We are leading uh, top businesses, U.S. corporations, big corporations. Uh, so, you know, Indians in and Indian Americans, rather, in positions of leadership. How do you see that um, that having changed over the years? You, of course, now have a, a person of Indian origin running for president as well. Yes, absolutely true. And it's been just a phenomenal change, even during the time that I've been involved in public life in America. When I first went to work in the Senate, um, there were very few Indian Americans in government, in the corporate world, uh, really in almost any sphere of American public life. Most of the Indian American community was much more uh, behind the scenes. That's no longer the case. The Indian American community has thoroughly come into its own, uh, so much so, as you rightly point out, uh, in the business world, particularly in the high-tech world, it's just utterly unexceptional for people of Indian origin to be leading the biggest and most vibrant companies in America. In the cultural scene, as we're seeing in Long Island, uh, this is not sort of a fringe in America. This is very much uh, the heart of America. So I think in all spheres, in politics, in business, in culture, Indian Americans have arrived. Absolutely. I think that's an interesting point. And um, Professor Behel, you know, as somebody who is from the world of academia, you know, the Indian, um, how do I put it? Well, the, not just human resources, but also the Indian mind, how that has been used or put to use uh, as far as the U.S. is concerned. Well, uh, you know, there are so many Indians in academia in the U.S., the number of Indians who own uh, or, or who have patents to their name, uh, that has also grown tremendously uh, in the past uh, 10 years, particularly in the past 20 years, rather. How do you see that, you know, the, 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 the Indian mind uh, and the Indian's role in academia as far as the U.S. is concerned? So, um, you know, I think it's needless to say the contributions that Indians have made and people of Indian origin have made to academia. Most of my colleagues, right, are of Indian origin. Either they were brought up here or, you know, they were educated in India and then moved here for their PhD or higher education pursuing a master's degree. Most of my students, I teach cybersecurity and most of my students 
are from India, you know, wanting to learn about cybersecurity, cybersecurity practices, network security, application security, and a lot of these um, 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 subject areas is where Indians have really succeeded, right? So when we talk about the contributions, I mean, one great example is, of course, uh, Geeta Gopinath, right? I think of her being uh, the deputy director of IMF and the contributions that she has made to the field of economics and, um, um, you know, her contributions to academia at Harvard University, right, being a scholar. Um, and you look at her and so many other examples of people in the f who made significant contributions in the field of astronomy, in the field of computational imaging, and now AI, right? One of the discussions that um, Biden and Modi had was, um, um, you know, around uh, H1B. And that's been a discussion, not just right in this Quad Summit, but it's been something that's been discussed for a while, the uh, the restrictions and then obviously the need sure. for um, um, you know AI skill, high skilled labor in the United States so again India is a big contributor right mm. contributor to that 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 demand for labor mm. Mm. high skilled labor yes so and it's not just academia and I'm just, and what I'm trying to say is it, it's it's yes, that it, demand it is just all around sectors. I think that's that's an important point you're making mm -hmm. um, but mr. blank uh, how important is this people to people connect when it comes to you know India US ties and you know our diplomatic relations as well I think it's very important because the United States tends to make policy on the basis of how comfortable uh, people feel with each other how much affinity they feel so is the US going to make a sacrifice if necessary well for a nation that feels like they are uh, kindred spirits, more so. Is the U.S. going to offer uh, benefits in the geostrategic world? Well, more so if there's a tie. And right now, Indian Americans are very much in the mainstream and at the center, the heart of, of American society. That was not necessarily the case a generation or two generations ago. Hmm. And uh, I think that really can't help but have an impact on the, the top level nation to nation contacts. Mm. So in that sense, do you see that diplomacy has moved away or perhaps moved beyond just, uh, you know, the larger issues of say defense and security and innovation to of course, um, more human, uh, you know, a more human diplomacy in the sense that we are also looking at creating jobs, uh, the semiconductor push, uh, the you know, global supply chains, employments, so of course, these are also issues, climate change for that matter, AI, these are also issues that, that are as important. Yes, exactly. Uh, when I first um, when I first went to India and wrote my first book, which was a retracing of the Ramayan, the American image of India was all very stereotypical. Uh, the sort of things you know you probably have heard of maharajas and tigers and that sort of thing. That's not Americans' image of India today. Now, if you ask, if you go to Iowa and farm country and ask, what's your impression of India? People will talk about um, high tech. They'll talk about doctors. They'll talk about partnerships uh, for the future. Um, the the image that most Americans have grown up with is far, far out of date and has already changed tremendously. Would you agree with that, that there has been a significant shift uh, you know, in, in the perception of the West as far as, you know, India is concerned, particularly in the past 10 to 15 years. And this is not uh, just some, just one person's achievement. It's the entire community's achievement because we have grown and with that perception has shifted. All right, before I come to you, uh, Professor Zina Bell, we, we are joined by a big newsmaker on the show. And for that, Vishnu, it's over to you. Well, joining us now, a very special guest, uh, Ami Bera, is one of the foremost um, non-resident Indians, Americans uh, who've done incredibly well in, uh, in politics. He is uh, a member of the U.S. Uh, House of Representatives. He represents California since 2013. Mr. Bera, wonderful to speak to you once again. Thanks very much. Uh, Prime Minister Modi over here in the United States. I'm actually outside the venue where there's going to be this mega diaspora event. Um, Modi has a huge connect with members of, uh, the, of, of uh, you know, of the Indian community in the United States of America. How important is that really in building trust between India and America? Yeah, I think it's an incredibly important. And thank you for having me on. Um, I was listening to the prior conversation. You know, my parents immigrated from Gujarat in the 1950s. And when I was growing up, it was a very small community. But you look to where we are today, five members of Congress. You have the Democratic nominee for president. Um, 
you know, we're 1% of the population, 8%, 9% of all doctors, um, technology workers. Um, so I think there is a deep connection between the diaspora um, and our cultural roots in India. And I think President Prime Minister Modi understands that. Uh, Mr. Behrab, you know, you would have uh, taken a look at the bilateral agreement signed yesterday between India and the U.S. It just seems to me that in terms of deliverables, we've gone well beyond this being a talk shop. They, you know, there's a serious effort at technology transfers, a serious effort at growing the economic relationship. Uh, it is substantive. It's not just about talking about change. It's actually about implementing it. Uh, very much so. I mean, I think there's a real opportunity, you know, as we think about the technology sector, as we think about supply chain redundancy. India now is, the, you know, probably the world's largest manufacturer of vaccines. So there's a partnership in health, you know, seeing this cancer moonshot. I think we can take Indian doctors and academics working with American academics to really solve some of the, the world's most daunting challenges. And again, I think that's a testimony. You know, you see the achievements of the diaspora here in the United States. And, you know, I think it's a natural progression of the relationship between the two countries. Mr. Behra, now that I have you, I must ask you, it's election season now in the United States. Kamala Harris versus Donald Trump at the end of the last debate. It did appear that Kamala Harris was uh, a little bit ahead. But if you look at Donald Trump's performance in the past, in the last elections, he sort of tends to, uh, to, to make a rail mark towards the end of the campaign itself. Uh, how do you see this election campaign in the U.S. going? You know, I think this is going to be a very close election. Yeah, I, I know the vice president very well in her campaign team, and they're running extremely hard. They understand that, you know, it's you, that she's running from behind and she has a lot of ground to, to make up in, in a short period of time. I think she's going to win, but obviously I'm biased. I think it is going to be a very close election. And the, the diaspora can make a big difference. If you think about Georgia, you have a vibrant Indian American community, Nevada, a vibrant Indian American community. Pennsylvania, a vibrant community. And in elections that might be decided by a few thousand votes, if the Indian American diaspora turns out and votes for Vice President Harris, that could be the difference. Mr. Behra, in the last couple of days, we've seen the reemergence of the, of the Pannun issue, as it were. But there is no mention of that in the bilateral agreement between both sides. Do you believe that, uh, you know, as far as the relationship is concerned, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not something that really stops the process of change and progress. No, I, I, I'd agree with that. I also, um, you know, the other areas that we've been talking a lot to the Indians about, and I'm sure it's coming up with the Quad, is the Indian Ocean region, making sure, you know, we're seeing the challenges in the South China Sea. We want to make sure that we keep the maritime security in the Indian Ocean secure, and India is a big partner in that as well. So, again, I think this was a very timely um, Quad meeting. Yeah, was, as President Biden wraps up his administration, and I think the momentum will, will continue forward regardless of who's in, in the White House. And a final question to you, the fact that we had Prime Minister Modi visit Joe Biden at his house, a personal invite over there. In fact, I was outside his residence yesterday reporting live. It just seems to be that there's been this personal connect between the two leaders which has really developed. And I think it's important to uh, once again sort of stress that you know, when it comes to the India-U.S. relationship, it's bipartisan. Uh, Prime Minister Modi's had a great equation with Donald Trump. He's had a great equation with Joe Biden as well. Absolutely. And, and again, the relationship with President Biden goes all the way back to um, you know, when he was Senator Biden. You know, during the U.S. civil nuclear deal with India, you know, pre at that time, Senator Biden was instrumental. When he was Vice President Biden, he talked about the U.S.-India partnership being one of the most pivotal of the 21st century, and he's delivered that on that as president. And again, you saw President Trump visit um, India as well. So this is a nonpartisan relationship. It, you know, I think we Democrats and Republicans recognize the importance of the U.S.-India relationship. All right, Mr. Vera, thank you very much for being with us, and thanks uh, for uh, spending some time with us right here on NDT. All right, uh, Vishnu, stay on with us as we are counting down now to the Prime Minister's address to the Indian diaspora. But I mean, it's so incredible, the reports that you've sent us as well, how diverse uh, the Indian American community is. And it's really grown from strength to strength, isn't it? 
You know, what really struck me today, Vedant, was a woman from Moldova who has become an American citizen who's over here at the Modi event because she became friends with local Indians over here, came to love India so much so that she decided she wanted to learn Garba. She learned it professionally and was beautifully dressed over here and has performed over here and will be inside and hopes to meet Prime Minister Modi. That gives you an idea of the diversity of what we are seeing over here. It's not just an NRI event, you know, you've got people from different communities, different uh, races present over here. Uh, you know, it just goes to show that the, uh, the attraction that Prime Minister Modi has uh, for different communities, different people all across America, that's, you know, that, that's very much uh, something that uh, people look forward to and it is a fact. I mean, you've got 13,000 people inside over here. Uh, that's a huge number of people in a, you know, packing this uh, really relatively, uh, you know, medium-sized uh, community uh, stadium, as it were. Uh, and they've come from everywhere. So, you know, I mean, there is that sense of enthusiasm, excitement. As far as NRIs are concerned, you know, I interviewed a group of NRIs from Odisha. I interviewed um, somebody from uh, Rajasthan. I interviewed uh, two people who are jewelers who made for the last year and a half a small statue entrusted in diamonds of uh, Prime Minister Modi. And all they want to do is they just want to hand it over to them. I asked them how much is that actually worth. They said that no, this is not about cost. It's about what we feel for our Prime Minister. And we just want to give him this uh, gift. And you know, it was a really, it was a touching gesture of, of um, uh, from, from, from people who really look upon Prime Minister Modi as being a really important part of their lives. Um, I spoke to people from South India, uh, you know, who are here as well, um, you know, wanting to be a part of this. So the, the pan uh, NRI uh, sort of reach that the Prime Minister has is something which is quite evident to me today. A genuine sense of excitement, little kids who've been practicing, um, uh, you know, little dance routines for a while, wanting to come over here, their parents explaining to them uh, why they are here. A seven-year-old boy told me when I asked him, you know, why are you here? He says, I'm here for Modi. So uh, it is interesting, absolutely f uh, fantastic. And, you know, I mean, the Prime Minister's touch with the non-resident Indian community, the diaspora, uh, is very much intact. If anything, it's growing. Absolutely. The Prime Minister's touch certainly uh, is absolutely remarkable. Uh, Vishnu, but also the Indian-American community. I mean, you have NRIs now occupying leadership positions in the corporate world, of course, in politics. Uh, so that's also interesting. I mean, to put together an event of this magnitude really shows that you know, the Indian-American community has only grown over the years. So uh, that's a great question, Vedant, and I'll tell you why. You know, I've interacted and interviewed the organizers of this event last evening. And there were a bunch of non-resident Indians who each uh, pulled out their uh, checkbooks and, uh, and, and, and paid $100,000 each, $100,000 each to help make this uh, uh, event take place. Uh, there were others who put in $50,000 each. Um, and it's not just, uh, you know, showcasing their, uh, their personal wealth or talking about their personal wealth. It's the fact that they are in a position to do that because they've done so incredibly well. Um, I met somebody yesterday who runs 2,000 petrol pumps uh, in the United States. I met somebody else uh, who is seen to be a stainless steel magnet in the United States. Uh, I've you know, been uh, talking extensively uh, to a, a cancer specialist who is one of the primary organizers of this event, Dr. Bharat Barai, who has done incredibly well as a non-resident Indian. He works closely with uh, you know, the, the political leaders across the spectrum, but again, somebody who is wealthy enough to have put in that money to help make this event actually come true. They booked out this hotel just behind me uh, where there are hundreds and hundreds of Indians, non-resident Indians who've actually come. And these were just a couple of examples of people who've done so well. Uh, when I was in Wilmington uh, yesterday, early in the morning and uh, Prime Minister Modi was yet to arrive, I came across a family of physicians. So there's the father who's a physician, both the boys who are physicians and to become doctors uh, in America and the, the training that you need to go through, the years of rigorous work um, and to be successful just gives you an idea of how this community is uh, truly remarkable. They are of course one of the, uh, uh, one of the richest communities in the United States uh, among uh, migrants over here. They are perhaps the most prosperous uh, but they are standing across industries uh, in various spheres of life, including increasingly American politics, is remarkable. Remember Kamala Harris's own Indian background, her mother came from India, you know, decades back. So, I mean, to, to have uh, potentially a woman of, uh, you know, part Indian origin become the next president of the United States, just think about it. Uh, it is truly remarkable. So, 
you know, as much as we've been talking, Vedant, about the bilateral relationship between India and America, the economic relationship, the strategic relationship, the defense relationship, you know, it's underwritten by the people-to-people the -people connect, which is so important. Absolutely, Vishnu, thanks so much for getting us all the color, the excitement uh, there at Long Island. This has been now counting down to the Prime Minister's address, uh, expected at around 9.15, 9.30 p.m. Indian time. So that's going to be important. For now, we'll step into a short break now, but this remains our top focus on it. Welcome back. We are counting down to the Prime Minister's address to the members of the Indian diaspora in Long Island in the US. Uh, this is, of course, one of the highlights of the Prime Minister's visit to the US. It's day two and it began with, uh, you know, the Quad Summit, the Summit of the Future. And, of course, now that crucial uh, diaspora event uh, in Long Island in New York, reminiscent of what happened uh, in Madison Square and, of course, the Howdy Modi event as well in 2019. Um, these are live pictures from Long Island. Well, uh, Indian culture on display and uh, what diversity, what vibrance uh, there uh, in Long Island. In fact, dancers from across Indian styles really performing uh, at that stage there in Long Island. Um, what does it really mean? What is the messaging behind this? Let me bring in my guests. Uh, Jonah Blank is with us and also Ambassador Meera Shankar will be joining us in a short while from now. Mr. Blank, as we were discussing earlier, you know, this diaspora diplomacy has become such an important part of the Prime Minister's visits abroad, particularly in the U.S. Um, why is that? Why do you think, uh, you know, the, the, this emphasis on the Indian diaspora and making sure that that outreach is there every time the Prime Minister visits the U.S.? Well, it's not unique to India. Um, most countries with a yes. significant diaspora community uh, do try to mobilize their diaspora. The Indian American diaspora is both larger and more politically potent than many others. And Prime Minister Modi has really emphasized his outreach. So he is extending the efforts of his predecessors, but he's also knocking on an open door because the Indian American diaspora is really uh, eager to be courted and eager to have uh, the rest of the nation um, see them for who they are. Absolutely. And Ambassador Meera Shankar is also with us now. Ambassador Shankar, uh, you know, these are visuals that uh, we have seen over the years, particularly in the past decade, uh, whether it was the uh, Madison Square event and, of course, the Howdy Modi event. Um, such an important pillar of uh, the Modi diplomacy is this people-to-people -people connect. Um, and, and just not that, but also the sort of cultural exchange. I mean, the fact that, you know, so many antiquities have been returned to India. If you remember last time when the Prime Minister went to the US, he had those specially curated gifts for President Biden that represented Indian culture. So, you know, this cultural exchange and this emphasis on Indianness, I think that's such an important part of the Prime Minister's diplomacy. Ambassador Shankar, go ahead. All right, we seem to have lost that line with Ambassador Shankar. We'll try and fix that. Uh, but uh, Jonah Blank, would you try, like to take that question? Um, <clears throat> sure. I think that uh, Prime Minister Modi has emphasized the cultural aspects of governance, both in India and abroad. Uh, Every uh, leader tries to reach out to a diaspora community, but Prime Minister Modi has really made one of his hallmarks uh, the emphasis on Indian culture and reviving Indian culture at home and promoting it overseas. So it really shouldn't be a surprise that this is part of his program, a key part of his program in the United States as well. Absolutely. I think that's an important point you're making. And also, you know, just um, looking at some of the other important aspects of the Prime Minister's visit as we stay on these live pictures, um, you know, the bilaterals and, uh, you know, the Quad Summit as well, it was described as a summit of the future. How did you look at what the Prime Minister said about Indo-Pacific? So India there also pitching itself as a voice of the Global South, saying that a peaceful, open and inclusive Indo-Pacific is something that's non-negotiable. That's a priority. Yes. And this has been a key talking point for India for several decades. Uh, I think it becomes all the more important as India rises in both 
military prominence, in economic prominence, and just in geopolitical prominence throughout the world, and particularly in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, one of the things that Prime Minister Modi is emphasizing is that this is not new. India has been uh, at the very center of Indo-Pacific life for millennia, and uh, that this is really um, uh, India's natural place. Uh, I think that part of it is given more emphasis by Prime Minister Modi than uh, we may have seen um, in, in some, uh, some other periods of Indian history. Absolutely. And Ambassador Shankar is now back with us. Uh, Meera Shankar, the question that I was asking you earlier is that this emphasis on, in a sense, almost reclaiming India's um, ancient past and sort of bringing that and juxtaposing it with our diplomacy. I think that's really been almost a project that the Prime Minister has undertaken. Uh, you know, last time around when the, uh, when the Prime Minister went to the US, he had those specially curated gifts which represented various parts of Indian history. Uh, you know, so he has a lot of personal interest, I believe, uh, you know, in, in making sure that there is this adequate representation of India's uh, incredible past every time he goes abroad. Yes, uh, I think that's an important element of uh, Prime Minister Modi's diplomacy. Um, India is geographically placed in a way in which it looks eastward to Southeast Asia and East Asia and westward to the Gulf and the oil-rich states. So we have been very fortunately placed at the heart of the Indo-Pacific and are also considered a civilizational state, one of the two major civilizational states in Asia, the other being China. Uh, but I think this meeting, the Quad Summit and the Summit of the Future, is looking more at the contemporary world which has been beset with crises and uh, with tensions. And uh, I think the four democracies who are members of the Quad look specifically at the Indo-Pacific region and what they can do to bring, uh, to ensure that uh, the Indo-Pacific is uh, free, open, inclusive, and prosperous and anchored in the rule of international law, particularly international maritime law. So um, I think uh, the Quad Summit, which Prime Minister Modi attended, had some substantive outcomes. Of course, it was a farewell to President Biden and to Prime Minister Kishida of Japan, for whom this is going to be the last summit. Um, some stock taking as to what has been achieved till now and new directions for the future. Mm. There are some very interesting initiatives which have been announced, yes. including expansion of the Maritime Domain Awareness Program, which involves information sharing um, uh, about the positioning of ships uh, in the Indo-Pacific to the Indian Ocean, with India's participation in this part of the program, uh, it will also involve capacity building and training for other partners, other countries in the Indo-Pacific to be able to use the tools and the information which is being shared under the Maritime Domain Awareness Program. Uh, there's also going to be a um, logistics network, uh, which uh, is looking at a pilot program for joint airlift uh, by the four countries, uh, which mm. would enable them to act more swiftly Absolutely. in the event of disasters. Mm. And of course, their coast guards are now going to cooperate with each other, um, you know, uh, yes, I think those are all uh, extremely important uh, aspects that you're mentioning, Ambassador Shankar, including, of course, the uh, India-US drug framework and also all the other aspects that you listed. Uh, but Ambassador Shankar, as we stay on these live pictures coming in from Long Island, uh, let me also uh, 
ask you, these are not just all admirers of the Prime Minister, I'm sure there are critics of the Prime Minister as well here, um, but to have a forum like this where critics and admirers alike from the Indian diaspora can come and interact with the Prime Minister, I think that's a format that's extremely interesting, isn't it? Yes, it, it personalizes in a sense the uh, relationship between the two countries. It makes it about people uh, rather than just files and bureaucratic offices. But, you know, it can work in a country like the U.S., which is very diverse and which is fairly confident about its own uh, society and culture. In smaller countries, it can be, uh, it can arouse sensitivity. So, for instance, Singapore had said no to such an event. So, I think there's a fine line which has to be walked because they are primarily citizens of America and their loyalty lies there. Yet, at the same time, they want to nourish their cultural roots which lie in India, and that fine line, I think, has to be maintained. Hmm. Absolutely. That's an interesting point you're making. Um, and Mr. Blank, uh, before I wrap this discussion, what are you expecting the Prime Minister to speak this time? Of course, there are uh, you know, a few headlines, a bunch of headlines, always uh, the Prime Minister uh, speaks abroad. But what are some of the areas you're looking at uh, as far as the Prime Minister's address is concerned about uh, 20 to 25 minutes from now? Yeah, I, I, I agree with Ambassador Shankar about the importance of realizing that Indian Americans are Americans. This is not a, uh, a group that is sort of living abroad for a time and then plans to go back home. So Indian Americans straight across the political uh, spectrum uh, are proud of their heritage, regardless of who is president in the United States, regardless of who is prime minister in India. So we shouldn't assume that this is a Modi event. This is more of an India cultural event that Prime Minister Modi is headlining. As for what Prime Minister Modi is likely to talk about, I think he probably will be emphasizing uh, some of these broad civilizational people-to-people -people, uh, and cultural themes rather than the specific deliverables coming out of Wilmington. Because this Quad Summit was really more about uh, building relationships than about specifically here is the frontline news. A lot of the frontline news was very important. For example, uh, US and India cooperation in a cancer project, particularly cervical cancer throughout the Indo-Pacific. I'm sure Prime Minister Modi will mention that, but it's not going to be as much of a policy speech as a people and a cultural speech. Absolutely. And I agree with you that it's not just a Modi event. It's really about the Indian American community there, which has really grown from strength to strength. But the fact that you have a prime minister like Prime Minister Modi who's able to sort of, um, you know, pull the crowds that we see there, I think that's also an interesting aspect to look at. But we'll sip into a short break now. Uh, this remains our top focus on LBT. by a member of the Indo-American community of the USA. They are the force behind Modi and US events here at NASA philosophy. Tell us about what we can expect. We're all waiting for the event to start. I'll start with numbers. Uh, a magnificent uh, event that's been put together in a matter of weeks. Uh, we have over 20,000 people that were registered. But due to capacity and things like that, unfortunately, we weren't able to accommodate in this venue. So they're going to have about 15,000 people inside? 15,000, 15,000 to change. 13,000 to change. I did see lines of people outside, um, you know, getting to get in. So you're saying that the capacity of the state is going to be met fully at NASA? So yeah, I mean, the way it's going to be done, the protocols and things like that, I see everything. Now, I'm thinking of 2014, that at the Madison Square Garden, we also had various of the buildings that were in the first trip to the United States. It was an even bigger venue, it had 20,000 people there. So, 
talk about the enthusiasm of the American community for Francis the Willy. Have it increased, have it plateaued, have it increased. We have a smaller value compared to last time. So, I think I can say, culturally speaking, we have over yeah, 500 organizations represented. And I think and these are diverse organizations, which leads to, again, another amazing breadth of Indians. You know, how many cultures for millennia for existing? And here in the US, we have over 500 or 5 million, sorry, Indian Americans. Five, 5 million Indians from Indian origin. And so the numbers are massive. Um, the, again, the space constraints, this will put together in a matter of weeks. And so logistics, you know, again, 60 plus buses across the country, uh, primarily in the Northeast, you know, going into Ohio and various other states, uh, 40 plus states represented. Uh, so there's a quite significant number of, uh, again, threat. People that are coming in. What are we expecting to see? I know that Prime Minister Modi will be speaking, of course, he's the highlight of the event, but other than that, we hear that it may be a surprise yet. Peter, any indication who that is, what that is, and what else you see on stage behind us? I think the mystery will you know, unravel very quickly and very soon. Uh, stay tuned. It's going to be a phenomenal event. Uh, I can't speak about the, the cultural components. Yeah, give us an idea of who we're so, going to you are uh, not surprised. Yeah, yeah, so 500 artists and performers. Again, you know, showcasing the amazing talents and amazing philosophies of the Indian diaspora, right, of the Indian philosophies. Uh, so that's going to be amazing. There's one word that uh, summarizes, um, you know, the the, the number of people coming here is diversity. They're from all sorts of backgrounds, all sorts of professions. Rajkumar with me is in the jewelry business. And what is your name, sir? Asit. And you're also in the jewelry yes. business, right? Yes. And you've been in the US for how long? For 30 years. 30, and you've been And I've been for 40 years. And what is this that you wanted to show us? Okay, so Pooja, just zoom in over here. This is a statue we made for our Prime Minister Modi. And this is, is all in lab-grown diamond, which he, unone, Biden ko jab gift diya tha, we got an inspiration from there. It took us almost one and a half year to make this exact statue because we did a lot of errors and trials and everything. And this is the exact enamel statue we were able to make it and in, in Surat. And uh, we are hoping to give this to uh, our Prime Minister. So this, one was made, this was made in Surat. This was made in Surat. And you designed it and you ordered it. We have and it it's taken a, a year and a half to make, over to, to make it and uh, you want to hand it over to the Prime Minister. Yes. Have you made a request? We have sent a request to PMO office once but we didn't get a chance to see him while I was traveling to India. Right. But most probably I'm hoping to see him here. If not, then our next visit will be in December in India. All right. Well, that's an absolutely incredible story. How difficult was it to fashion this? Can you explain? Yeah, because we made three, four times and, you know, like finally we came to the solution that this is a perfect one. And it took like at least uh, 30 to 40 people uh, work hard work for one and a half years to make it exactly the same statue. And there is thousands of pieces of lab grown diamonds and lab grown diamonds is representing the Indian industry. They are more than 100,000 workers are working in this industry. And our uh, Prime Minister, Mr. Modi, is promoting this and all over the world and we are doing the same thing because this is environmental friendly and totally green what is the value of this if i can ask you uh, there is no value when yeah. it's a prime minister modi's there's no value we don't look at a cost we'll just want to present it to him as a souvenir and we don't want to copy all we don't want to make any other statues like that this is the one of a kind well, congratulations. It's absolutely fantastic. And I realize the hard work that went into it. Wonderful speaking to both of you.